Good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, this morning, we're um, going to um, cover what we originally had covered for um, this time slot. And then I'm going to try and shorten some things. And then we'll see if we have time to put the land use land cover change classification at the end or if we need to put it at some other day. Um, but so today I'll be, this morning I'll be talking about land use land cover change and then you'll be doing an exercise on how to map it. Um, ben has actually covered a lot of this so I'm going to go pretty fast at the beginning. In particular I'm going to skip the part where we define land use and land cover but then, sorry, um, I'll, um, we'll briefly talk about how to quantify land use land cover change so that's the LULCC and then uh, talk about the major land use land cover changes trends globally nationally and um, quote unquote locally but focusing on the US for that one and what are the environment and briefly again what are the environmental consequences of land use land cover change so the definitions I'll skip but I'll you have you'll have those slides and I just figured I'd keep them in here so you could see just a different way of presenting that I mean it's the same information just different uh, vocabulary basically um, so the one thing I w want did want to say is like Ben said most um, most maps of land cover also often have a land use component kind of baked into it but most land uses you cannot see by examining um, remotely sensed data so you'll usually need some sort of ancillary information to do a true land use um, map but in reality most of these uh, data are going to be land use land cover oftentimes abbreviated LULC so how do you quantify you know, this uh, land use land cover change? Well, first you need that land use, you need at least one, two land use land cover maps um, to look at change, so two time steps. And it can be any two time steps. It can be over the course of you know, a month, decade, 50 years, whatever is available, um, but you do need two time steps. And then, um, you know, if you have three, then you can start looking at trends, or three or more, you can start looking at trends. Um, but in order to make these land use land cover maps, you typically need um, to use uh, one of these or more, um, one of these um, approaches. So usually it's remotely sensed data. Um, you can do some of this with aerial photos, um, both interpretation and digitization, which is just a fancy way of saying tracing. So you can trace what you see on the ground, and there are rules for how to do that. But if you do it for two time step, then you could look at the change over time. Um, and obviously you can classify the image um, and make your own land cover maps for two time steps and do it that way as well. Um, here are just images of air photos, um, but we'll skip. Um, in, uh, in visual interpretation, what you do is you'll really look, I mean, you'll just, it's, it's um, kind of, it's sleuthing, um, but and using your knowledge of the area to determine what's on the ground. Um, typically you can see cropped agricultural land because you'll see um, you know defined boundaries or smooth even texture on the image um, and uh, that, that'll give you an insight into what if something is growing there sometimes even what is growing there. Um, pasture tends to take irregular uh, shapes and sometimes you'll see patches of trees in there. Uh, transportation is typically very linear patterns so that's uh, fairly easy to, um, to determine where it is. Um, and then uh, basically you can um, you can digitize all those things, i.e. trace them in the computer to make that, Im to transform that image um, into a uh, vector format. Remember, point, even, you could even do points, but you can do obviously lines and polygons, but you could place points on your um, image and at each point say, oh, this is forest, oh, this is ag, oh, this is, and then you would have essentially a digital representation in some form. Um, can anyone tell me what this is? Just one of those cool images. 
cost? Yes. It's a radio station. Yeah, it's a huge um, transfer station for uh, railroad wagons and things like that. It's in um, Atlanta, uh, but you can see the land, um, you know, change of land that had to take place for um, this thing to be there. Um, most times, uh, land use land cover mapping is done through image classification. And I'll just briefly say, you know, so, so you all know that the sun emits electromagnetic uh, radiation and that radiation is then, um, you know, and some of it's reflected back in the atmosphere and reflected off buildings. Um, it can also be absorbed and re-emitted um, by all of these um, structures and, and natural um, parts of the landscape. And then um, what, what is reflected um, can be captured by a satellite. Um, and like Ben showed, you know, there'll, there'll be different bands um, depending on what um, instrument is on board this satellite. And there are even multispectral instrument and hyperspectral instruments that'll have hundreds of bands um, where they collect that reflected solar radiation. Um, and so we'll do an exercise where we use that radiation um, in order to, from basically the wavelengths um, that are captured um, by the instrument on board the satellite, we can use that to make a land use land cover map. But I'll just um, preface it by saying, anytime all this energy traverses the atmosphere, um, depending on the atmospheric conditions, Please? that signal is changed. Please? Yes. Can you use that uh, band with the SB because you don't see that you are showing? The Wait, clicker? Sorry. Yes. Oh, do you have the... Here, this is the... You have to plug it in. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's not going to work. No, I already tried it the other day, but I can use the mouse. Um, so, so I was showing this graph. Um, and so you've got electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun and then being reflected back to the satellite. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, just the front button. It's almost out of batteries, but we have more batteries. Okay, um, and that signal is traversing the atmosphere, and so you will have to do some sort of atmospheric correction um, before you can do the I image interpretation. And that's just a preface to one of our labs. But today we want to talk about land use land cover um, change. Um, and all land use land cover change is, it, it means you're transitioning from one land use land cover class to another over time. So here's an example. Um, the green pixels are forest and the beige pixels are anything else. And from 1974 to 2000, you see um, quite a bit of deforestation in um, this area. So you're looking at, you know, it's, it's from something to something else and you're interested in quantifying um, that, that change. Um, and in my case, I'm really interested in mapping that change. Where does it occur? Oh, and I'm trying to change slides with this. It doesn't work. Um, so here's just a, a, a quick example. This is the state of South Carolina on the east coast of the United States. Um, and uh, developed, or shown in the red uh, hues, forest is green, um, here's coastal areas and rivers. Um, this is for 2001. And then uh, this is for 2011. And I'm zooming in on uh, this uh, city. And just visually, you know, qualitatively, you can easily say, oh, I see an increase in urbanization, right? There's more built up land over this um, decade. Um, and that's totally fine, but it's way more interesting to, um, to put a number on it. Now, when you're doing land use land cover um, change, 
you need to, the two time steps need to have the same land use land cover classes or something that you can collapse into the same land use land cover classes. So you do have to watch for that correspondence. Um, so let's say, you know, like the one you were using yesterday had four different types of cropland and, you know, I think it had like six different types of forest. And let's say you got another one at another time stamp, uh, time stamp um, that had two different types of forest and, and like two different types of, of cropland. Um, it might be in your best interest to collapse all the cropland into one agricultural category, all the forests into one, and then in the other image, same thing. And then you can more easily um, compare the two and trust that comparison. Um, if you, if, um, oops, um, the Anderson classification that Ben showed you yesterday is, is a great way to collapse things and, and not have people, you know, in reviews and stuff scream at you. Um, so, so, you know, the, the, the highest hierarchy in that one is um, urban, ag, rangeland, forest land, water, wetland, barren, tundra, and ice. Um, but, and you can use, you know, um, the, the, the lower level, well, higher level, well, more refined um, classification. Um, but, but I always find that looking at this um, helps me if I need to collapse um, land covers together. So I just wanted you to have it. Um, okay, what's also interesting with land use land cover chains is really to model um, it. So um, this is, this was my um, PhD advisor and what he would do oftentimes is he would have two or three time steps of land use land cover and then he would train a neural network model to, um, to basically rebuild um, that, that land use land cover change and then he would apply that forward in time and say okay if we are going to continue to see the trends we saw over the three time periods into the future then this is what the land is going to look like. Um, so he actually has a model called the land transformation model. It's free, it's on his website. Um, I, I built the tutorial for it um, and he and, and so and, and you can use it to um, do some of that forecasting um, I, uh, for business as usual if we see the same trends over time over the long long term um, what um, what is the land cover land use land cover going to look like and he's also um, used what's called backcasting to try and model changes that happened in the past, even though we didn't have some of those data. Although the best example I've ever seen of backcasting is, um, is um, through the Manha Manahata project. Um, and there's a cool TED talk about this. Uh, but basically, they looked at current, this is New York City, there's Battery Park, um, you know, Wall Street. Um, and, and so they, they took the current uh, land use land cover and then they went back as far as they could in time with old satellite imagery and aerial photos and they, um, and they even looked at old paintings of the area. Um, that were hanging around galleries um, throughout the world to reconstruct um, pre-settlement uh, what, what um, New York City uh, w w would look like. Um, and so, I mean, they, they said, oh, it would be mostly forest, which I, is believable. Um, notice also, you know, it's skinnier. Um, all of this is actually built up land they filled in um, so that they'd have more um, real estate in one of the most expensive real estate markets in the world. Um, but that's called backcasting. Um, and, and so it's, it's just an interesting application. Um, but here's an example of, of um, forecasting um, from East Africa. It's a paper by um, Jennifer Olson et al. Um, and they, they did that approach I talked to you about earlier. They, they um, looked at land use, land cover, 
um, change, I think it was 2000, 2005, and then 2010, trained a model to replicate those as best as they could, and then set the model loose, you know, over time, the same um, forward, and they looked at um, expansion. The, 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 the big trend in these images is expansion of agriculture um, throughout the region. So how do you, excuse me, how do you look at land use, land cover trends? Um, and Ben covered this yesterday, so um, I'm just gonna briefly go over um, this part, but what are the major land use, land cover changes? I'm sure I don't have to tell you that it's um, mostly deforestation um, but, and um, to, uh, you know, to make room for uh, agriculture, basically. And then um, the other one is urbanization. And it can look like this, or it can look like where I live, um, lots of um, single family homes going into uh, what used to be agricultural land, and prior to that, what used to be forested land. Um, so just to make sure we're, you know, using the right almost vocabulary, the agricultural expansion would be you're transitioning from any land use land cover class to crops or agriculture. Deforestation is transitioning from the forest land cover class to any other class. And urbanization is any land cover class to this developed um, land cover and land use. At the local scale, what does that look like? Again, this is, you probably are familiar with this. Well, in, in our region, it's a bulldozer coming in and taking out um, the natural landscape and then placing something else above it. Um, if you look at more broad scale, so here's um, the Michigan, Muskegon River watershed um, in Michigan. Um, and here's, um, so about, yeah, a broader scale. And they'll look at on the x-axis time, and they're doing um, lots of forecasting. Um, and then on the y-axis, they'll have the change in um, in. Uh, well, they didn't put. <laughs> there's probably acres or hectares or something on the y-axis. Um, and then you know here you get a story of of. Um, reforestation or afforestation, um, a decline in agriculture, it wasn't, uh, it's not in the prime um, breadbasket of the US, and a steep increase, although this is um, kind of guesswork at that point, um, but a, 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 an increase in developed uh, urban. And if you have lots of time steps, you can easily do something like that. Um, here's another one at the regional scale. This is east coast of U.S. and this one starts to get at what I want you to do this after, uh, no, later on today with um, what changed into what. Um, so here they're showing you the net gains and net losses associated with forest land cover change. So on the on the x-axis, you have different time periods, so 73 to 80, 80 to 86, 86 to 92, 92 to 2000. And then on the y-axis, they, ha they have the, the um, square kilometer change. So anything below the zero here um, is um, things, um, is what replaced forest at each of these um, time steps, time intervals, and then anything above the line is um, what, um, so that, that area is seeing reforestation and afforestation, um, and so that's what is now forest and was replaced by. So um, overall, most of the uh, forest land cover has been lost to this developed category and then this mechanically disturbed category. And I don't totally remember what that is. Um, but then uh, the, the reforestation um, is coming from grassland and shrubland transforming into forests over time, as well as that loss of agricultural land to forest also over time. So I, I 
hate the colors in this graph, but I like the concept of this graph. Um, yeah. So on the y-axis, you have the di different time periods that they're looking at the, the, the transitions of land cover and land use. Um, and they're looking particularly at one, forest. And, and then on the y-axis, they have um, the kilo square kilometer, the area that changed to or from this forested land cover. Anything above the zero is things that were forest and that changed to something else. And then anything below are things that, um, no, anything below is things that were forest and changed to something else. Anything above is it was some other land cover class and the color tells you what land cover class that changed to forest. And so, I mean, so you can see the, the net changes. Um, so I think it's just neat because if you had just looked at, if you had just said, oh, overall we've had, you know, a, and I don't know what the exact number is, but, you know, we've had a 50% loss in forest. It's like, well, that doesn't tell the whole story, right? Um, it's, and there's forest going where it used to be, but also in new places. There's obviously lots of forest um, through the entire time period, um, but just this is a little bit more informative than the previous graph, although harder to interpret. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, and then what I think is neat is looking at. Um, those changes spatially, right? The two previous graphs were, were aspatial. It just told you across this entire landscape, you know, the East Coast or this Muskegon River watershed, um, what was going on. But the, the map, you know, so, so I always tell my students, you know, um, th there's this saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, I think a map is worth a million words. Um, but, but in this case, um, so, so this is the Midwest of the United States, and it does comprise of Minnesota. <laughs> It is, it is, but it's still in the Midwestern U.S. We've had this debate for two days now. What else would it be? Exactly. <laughs> North, uh, yeah, well, anyways. Um, but this is called the breadbasket of the United States, and um, throughout this region, the, the yellow, the, the dark, no, the orange and the, um, and the dark green are uh, corn and soybean. So it's called the corn and soybean belt of the United States. Um, and so this is a snapshot in time. I can't really remember what time, maybe 20, yeah, I think they had 2006. And so this is 2011. Um, and on this map there, it's the same, it's these states. No, it's these states. And they're looking at um, the grassland, the loss or, or gain of grassland over time. So any colors in the blue hues are, are um, places where grasslands have increased. And then you can see that the major story is loss of grassland. Um, so up to 3% loss of grassland over a relatively short time period, right? 2006 to 2011. Um, and this is the story of the expansion of this corn and soybean belt, westward expansion of the corn and soybean belt in the United States. Um, and we'll actually come back to this when we talk this afternoon about pollination, because it just so happens that the, major that the majority of honeybee, commercial honeybee hives in the United States spend their quote unquote summer vacation in this area. So all of a sudden, the changes in land covers there affect the majority of the commercial um, honeybee um, hives in the entire United States, which is kind of crazy. 
The other thing I would like to point out is this paper was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. And then you might see this inset. And the, if you know the shape of the United States, this is not projected. This is in a geographic coordinate system. And it should never, ever, ever have been in there. But so mistakes happen and they end up in one of the best journals. Well, supposedly one of the best journals. Um, so even these people don't understand um, that this is projected correctly. But this definitely is not projected. Just a side note. Um, and, you know, at the global scale, the, the major story is loss of forests. Um, and grasslands in order to feed ourselves and the animals that we eat or use for milk and etc. Um, so here, um, this is um, by Ruth DeFries, she's at Columbia. Um, and and the, the darker color is where you've seen the least change um, to croplands and rangelands. Um, and then the uh, light, you know, beige that isn't uh, orange, you know, yellow um, color. So this color is where nearly 100% of um, that particular pixel, right, this is a raster representation, has been changed um, over time. And I can't remember what exactly the time period was, but, you know, well, it's probably not 1700, but. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a neat little map. What are the environmental cons consequences of land use land cover change? There are many. This is one of the better um, graphs I've seen um, where that land transformation, you know, the land clearing, the, the um, deforestation for pa um, grazing, grazing purposes, etc. Um, leads to uh, biotic additions and losses, right? You have invasive species coming in, but obviously you um, also lose um, species in that landscape, um, which leads to uh, oftentimes a loss of biological diversity. Um, obviously, any kind of uh, land use, land cover change also affects the carbon cycle, the water cycle, nitrogen cycle, etc that also interacts with all these other things. Um, and then the big one is obviously climate change and, and um, uh, Ada will we'll talk about that more tomorrow. But all those things are linked and we don't completely understand all the ramifications of just clearing one little patch of land. And in particular, you know, when you change a whole bunch of patches of land across the globe, um, those things are linked in ways that we don't fully understand. Um, and here's just one last slide. Um, it's again by Ruth DeFries, but it makes a nice link between the ecosystem services um, and then what um, is altered um, with those land use, land cover changes. Um, so, the, you know, here's a good one that we haven't talked about. So when you urbanize or, or when you build up land in the typical fashion we've building them up, so um, with increased impervious surfaces, uh, you're going to see increased runoff and you're going to see a decrease of water flow into streams. Um, and that, that obviously impacts the provision of fresh water. Um, tropical deforestation releases CO2 to the atmosphere. That I'm sure you all know. This is an interesting one. So when you remove forest, you increase the albedo. So you're actually cooling the surface locally, but, in, but um, you have to think about it obviously globally um, where, um, where you're contributing to climate change. But locally, uh, you'll see um, a cooler surface because um, that dark forest is no longer, isn't absorbing as much el el electromagnetic radiation and re-radiating it at night. Um, yeah, 
So lots of lots of examples. If this is something that really interests you, um, it's a, it's a field of its own. It's called land change science. Um, here are a bunch of readings about that if you're interested. Um, but but yeah, I just wanted you to be aware of that.